morning, everybody. Good morning. How was your week? Was it, uh, was it a good week getting the kids back in school? Yeah, we can say that now all the kids are out. Yeah, right? Yes. <laughs> it's a great week. There you go. Good, good, good. As Jeff said, I'm going to continue on in the book of Romans. Have you liked this book? I'll tell you what. I'm going to tell you something. When, you, when uh, I heard what we were moving into, I thought, wow. We're, uh, cause, cause Romans is a packed full book and it's a th- deep theological book. And, uh, to, to get a hold of that, it was, it's, it's a little challenging sometimes, but, um, let me get to my, so, so we're going to talk about, uh, freedom today, freedom. Now we as Americans know what freedom's all about, don't we? Come on now. We all know what freedom's about, right? The land of the free. Right? How many freedoms have been taken away in the last five years? You know? We as Americans think that we have an idea and have this understanding of what freedom is. But I guarantee you, it's, uh, do, what, do we really know uh, what freedom is according to Romans chapter 6. We really don't because it's a whole different ball game. It's a whole different ball game, and uh, it's vastly different. And, and you know what? We can't, you know, we can't control all the freedoms outside of us, but God wants to increase the freedoms in us. He wants to increase the freedoms in us. Uh, I can't control all the freedom out there. I can't control what's happening out there and, quote, what freedoms are taken away from us. But I can, ch- I can control how free I am in here. Amen? Our study in Romans 6, uh, you know, we, we, we talk about, just to lay out uh, this book of Romans, uh, to start with, in, 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 the first, in the first three chapters, uh, it talks about the need for rescue. How many of you know we needed to be rescued? We needed to be rescued. First chapter 4, uh, we receive God's righteousness when you were justified by faith. And Jeff and Andrea talked about that last week. Justified, did you pick that up? What does justified mean? Just as if I hadn't sinned. Justification. They talked about that last week. So chapters 1 to 3, the need for rescue. And chapter 4, we receive God's righteousness then when we're justified by faith. And then chapter 5, those that are justified stand in God's grace and power. So we have this idea, we have this, this uh, 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 continuum, if you will, that that. We, we need to be rescued. Paul lays out in Romans, we need to be rescued. We've all fallen sin. Uh, we, we've fallen short, amen? No, there, there's no not one that hasn't fallen short. So we need to be rescued. And so then he comes back and he talks about how we can be rescued through the righteousness of Christ and how by being justified by Christ, just as if I hadn't sinned, it means that, that, that Jesus took my sin and, it's, it, and God sees me as just as if I hadn't sinned. And then we talk about in chapter 5, and, and, and uh, Jeff and Andrea talked about it last week, they talked about the hope the dynamic of hope and, and the dynamic of standing in truth. And, 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 and that chapter 5 is about standing in righteousness and standing in, uh, in, in firm in the power and the grace and the peace of God. Well, our, our study today really begins in the end of chapter 5. It says God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sin more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. 
So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What a great statement. What a great truth. Amen? What a great truth. Yet Paul's already ready to, uh, to ambush the argument there. That says... Well, okay, then if that's the case, if God's wonderful grace, if so just, so just as sin ruled over all people and brought them death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead. In other words, if there's more, if there's more sin, then more grace. If a little does a little good, a lot will do a lot of good, right? So he, he says, that, so the, he, he jumps the question that says, so I guess if I keep sinning then, if I sin more and more, then God's grace is more and more in my life. That's kind of cool, right? I mean, doesn't that make sense from a human perspective? And what it says? Paul says no. He just a flat out no. He says in, 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 in Romans 6, it says, Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. And that's emphatic. That's a, are you kidding me? That's the kind of way it is. It's like Paul was saying, are you kidding me? Are you real here? Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ, Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? We had a little baptism for Japheth. And when we, we had the, when we talk about being in the water, we, 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 use, we use this dynamic. That water represents kind of the, 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 the ground level, so to speak. And what we're doing is we're taking and burying the old man. We buried the old Japheth in there and we brought him up into new life, just like Christ rose from the dead. Just like that. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Paul anticipates the blow back there. He said basically they're saying, hey, if there's more grace given when, when there's more sin, then why not sin more so that more grace comes? Seems like a pretty good argument, right? But Paul says no. I mean, why not be drenched in a lot of God's grace than sprinkle a little bit? He says, we who have died to sin should no longer live it. Look at verse 5 and 6 here. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. I get the privilege of talking about a great thing today, sin. I bet you're all excited about that, aren't you? Does anybody here know what sin is? <laughs> All right. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about sin today. And, and because Paul is going to address this, he, he says here that the old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power. Does sin have power over you? Do you give sin power over you? Because it's Paul says here that Christ died so that sin would lose its power over you. Would lose its power. It, it, the Greek word here is render inoperative or out of business. It's like, it's like Christ came and he hung a sign over your head that says out of business to the enemy. To sin. He hung that sign up and says, no more. He's mine. How many have ever had uh, an update on your computer or something, and uh, it, you, get this, you, want, you get this update, and you get this little message that says, sorry, but this computer is not compatible with this new update. 
Did it ever happen to anybody? That's like our lives. When Christ came and we lost, the, we, he, he, he defeated sin and death, and, the, and sin lost its power over us, it's like, no, no, this is a new version. I, sorry, I can't take that update. I can't take that sin update anymore because I'm a new version here. So essentially, when you accepted Christ, God made a declaration to the devil that you're out of business. He was saying, you have no business here. This one belongs to me. He or she is mine. And it's not because of what we've done, because of what Jesus has done. We can't make ourselves live sinless. Christians, our scripture says that we all fall short, even Christians. Now, I want you to know that how many of you know that we're without Jesus, we are incapable of holy living? We are incapable of holy living as human beings, amen? amen. Holy living, which we're incapable of, will never bring salvation, but salvation should produce holy living. Now, I want you to hear that again. Holy living, which we're incapable of, will never bring salvation. We can't just live, quote, how many times have you heard someone that's at a funeral say, oh, they were a good person. They were a good person. You know, I know that they're in heaven because they were so good. I'm sorry, but being good doesn't make it. Just being good. You can't live holy enough. Holy living does not bring salvation, but salvation should produce holy living. And that's what Paul's addressing here. And that's all good news, but how many of you know we have a battle? We have a battle with this sin thing. We have a battle with, with uh, uh, it says in Galatians 5, 16, so I say let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. You feel this pull? This pull? I want to tell you, and Sandy and I were talking about this morning, sin has a pull. You ever notice that? Sin has a pull. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. There's this battle going on, this pulling back and forth, this sinful nature, and, 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 and your desire to, to live a holy life with God. And there's this pulling back and forth. It's an inward battle. And it's a battle for our freedom, our inward freedom, and our spiritual freedom. It's a battle. We have an impulse to go in one direction at the same time, an impulse to go the other direction. One impulse leads to slavery, the other to freedom. You see, that's what I mean by understanding what freedom truly is. We have this dynamic in us where we're being pulled by by this force, this sinful nature, as it's called, we're being pulled over here, but that leads to slavery. But holiness before God, being pulled into God's purposes and promises, leads to freedom. That's true freedom. You know, how many, we hear about freedom all the time anymore, don't we? The cultural progressives of our day, so to speak, of our society, they come at Christianity and say, you want to take away our freedom. How many have heard that before? That we're trying to take away their freedom. We want reproductive freedom. We want gender freedom. We want racial freedom. We want sexual freedom. Freedom, freedom, freedom. That's what we hear about, right? The land of the free. They want freedom. The truth is that issues like abortion are not freedom, rather something that imprisons women. 
for example. You know, I'm not afraid to talk about issues like that. I'm not afraid to talk about issues that are contrary, that go contrary to the scripture. And I don't know how many times I've heard from different women who have had, you hear the stories of the different women that have had abortions that put them in slavery. Put them in guilt. The slavery of guilt. That's done damage to their lives. Not just spiritual either. See, Christians aren't allowed, quote, to talk about morality issues such as marriage between a relationship between one man and one woman. One woman. We're not supposed to talk about marriage being between one man and one woman. But what's truth? It goes back to what's truth. Biblically speaking, sexual sin is wrong and not freedom. Sexual sin is wrong and not freedom. Everybody says, oh, but, oh my goodness, that's oppressive. I mean, it's their lives. They should be able to choose. That's your, you're being oppressive. Can I encourage you that sexual morality is supposed to be oppressive? I don't apologize for that. It's supposed to oppress sin. It's supposed to oppress sin. And we hear those things, and as, as believers, we tend to back off. Ooh, 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 wait a minute. Don't accuse me of this or accuse me of that. We talked about that in men's Sunday school class this morning. You see, what do you stand for? Are you willing to stand for what you stand for? Sin is sin. Paul's addressing this whole thing. Now, wait a minute. Don't keep sinning because grace abounds. Yeah, God's going to, God, there's forgiveness in Christ Jesus, but why do you want to live in slavery? Why not live in freedom? And if that's the case, why not speak freedom into people's lives? I'm getting off script here a little bit. We've gotten so, <laughs> how do I want to say this? I want to be careful here. We've gotten so careful about not, quote, judging. Can I encourage you? I don't have to judge. The word judges. God's word judges. It tells me. It tells me what truth is, right? It tells me what truth is. So why am I backing away from truth instead of moving forward to it? So then what's true freedom? It's interesting, Paul talks about freedom versus slavery four times in this chapter. His main point is this, you're either a slave to something or you're set, through, set free through Jesus Christ. Can I encourage you that you're a slave to something or you're set free? I don't care, you can talk to somebody and they can tell you how free they are, but if they don't know Jesus, they're in slavery to something. They're in slavery to something. The world's idea of freedom is to do what we want, when we want, to whom we want, wherever we want. In other words, it's the freedom to sin if we want to. We should have the freedom to sin. <laughs> I, I, see this, I see this in law enforcement there, this whole debate on whether or not to decriminalize 
uh, drugs and, and everything else and, and everything, you know, because they can choose. It's their life, and they can choose what they want to take and everything. If they want to get high, what do we care? They're just exercising their freedom. I mean, after all, it's their life. Truth be told, the freedom they're talking about is just another pathway to slavery. Do you know how many people I've talked to? Carrie, you'd know this as well, too, because you work in the jail. How many people I talk to? I mean, why do we have, why do we have classes for chemical dependency and addiction? To give them the tools to help them out of slavery. To help, to help them out of the dependency of that, that drug or that substance. You will, tell, you will hear people say that I wish I'd have never done it. I wish I'd have never took that first smoke. I wish I'd have never tried it. I wish when I was with those friends, I wish I could have, I could have, wish, I, I could have, I wish I would have said no. Because you know what? They're in slavery right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to give them freedom to be slaves to sin. Needless to say, I'm not a, a, uh, I am not a proponent of decriminalizing drugs. Not even marijuana. Oh, but marijuana's okay. I mean, it doesn't, come on. Do you know? Okay. Carrie, correct me if I'm wrong. How many people have said that marijuana is where they started? It started leading them into slavery started leading them into slavery. Better get back on script here a little bit. See, the thing is that we're not free to sin. We're free from sin. And there's a big difference there. Paul's saying, no, you're not free to sin, but you're free from sin. It's a whole different matter. You know, most of us like to see us as in charge of our lives. I'm the captain of my ship. Well, Paul's saying, guess what? If you're not free in Christ, you're not the captain of your ship. You're in slavery to something or someone. Let's take... Work, for instance. Let's take something like work. Some of you may have to pick up your feet. Your toes might get stepped on. If you can't stop working, you're a... What is it? Workaholic. Work has become your master. It dictates everything you do, your time, your priorities, your habits, your decision making, you're only, satis you're only satisfac satisfied when you work. You can't spend time with your spouse because you have to work. You can't go to your kids' events because you have to work. You can't have any downtime because you have to work. All of a sudden, guess what? Work has become your master. You are a slave to work. Oh, but I'm free. No, you're not. You're a workaholic. You're a slave to work. When Christ is the master, work becomes your slave. You start asking your master these questions. How much time should I give my job? What should I do with the income for my job? Things like that. Those kinds of questions that come when Christ is your master and work is your slave. True freedom is not doing what you want, but what he wants. That's true freedom. To do what Christ wants in your life. That is free. The great lie of sin. The great lie of sin is that it's willing to be your slave. What do I mean by that? We're deceived into thinking we can handle it. 
that no one will see, that we can just do it a little bit. That we can, you know, we'll just do it a little bit. Paul's highlighting the fact. He's saying that if you choose sin as your master, is the illusion is you can control it. I am telling you, sin will take you farther than you ever thought you'd go. You think you can control sin? You can't. It'll control you. The illusion is you can manage sin, but it will manage you. The illusion is you can hide sin, but it will expose you. Sin will take you farther than you ever intended to go. If sin becomes your master, which it will, if you let it, it will take all sensitivity to God's plan away from your life. You won't even be sensitive to what God wants anymore. It will destroy your joy, your hope, and your sense of victory. You will live in a constant state of fear of being exposed. Now, let me ask you this. Is there anybody here that has ever sinned and tried to hide it and were afraid somebody was going to find out? (laughs) Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your honesty. That sin... Brought, what it brought to me is it brought fear, fear of being exposed. Oh, but I can control it. I can, I can keep it from being exposed. No, you can't. It will eventually expose you. Oh, I can manage it. No, you can't. It will manage you. I can keep it hidden. No, you can't. It will tell you lies about who you are, saying you're too poor, you're too stupid, you're too ugly, you're too uninteresting, or too average to be used by God for his high calling. I want you to understand that when you met Jesus, a change process was set in motion. A change process was set in motion. When you met Jesus and you became a a Christ follower, a change process was set in motion. God began making you more like Jesus. Romans 6, 22 says this, Now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. Now you're free from the power of sin and become slaves, sin and become slaves to God. Slaves to God is freedom. It's not bondage. It's free. You know, a pastor once said, and I got to make sure I say this right, You're not who you will be when Jesus is finished with you, but you're not who you were when Jesus started with you. I say that one more time. You're not who you will be when Jesus is finished with you, but you're not who you were when Jesus started with you. That's kind of painful in some ways because I know what Jesus started with here. I'm so thankful that he was willing to start with me where I was. And I know that each, you know, the older I get, <laughs> how many of you, you, there's probably a number of you understand this, the older you get, the more you, how, the more you see how bad you are. Isn't that supposed to be the other way around? The older I get, the more I see how I need even more of God's grace. Paul's saying, don't go back. Don't go back to that. Don't go back. Paul says, I know you're going to ask, should we keep on sinning some more grace about? He says, no, don't go back to that. How many here would say they're embarrassed by past sin? Yeah. 
But I'm going to ask you even a harder question. That very sin that you're embarrassed about, how many times have you visited it in the last while? The challenge is, is the sin that that the sin that 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 we're embarrassed about. Why do we go back and visit it again? Granted, we talked about this pool. I get it. I get it. I get it. But if you were so embarrassed about it, why go back to it? Don't go back. Don't go back. So how do we live in freedom? I want to look a little closer at, at, at Romans 6.11. It says, For the death that Christ died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. See that word reckon in there? Now that's not a word we use too much, unless you're from uh, Alabama. Or something like that. I reckon. But it's interesting because in the Greek it means to consider, to think, to deem, to regard, or to count as done, or count as true. That's what reckon means. In other words, realize that you are completely dead to sin. It doesn't have the power over you any longer. My, uh, maybe some of you know that my dad was a funeral director. And I helped him. I'm not trying to get gross on you. I'm help, I helped him embalm a lot of bodies. Do you know what? I didn't have any, any, there was, we, not one, not one, not one body said, ouch, that hurts. Because they were dead. They were dead. They didn't feel it. Reckon. Reckon. Consider to think, to deem, to regard, and to count as done, to count as true. I count as true that I'm dead, that sin has lost its power in my life. The most important thing to know about the word reckon is the tense. Because it means a continual or ongoing basis. So we could translate the verse this way. Once and for all, deem yourself dead to sin. After that, keep it up. Keep counting yourself as one who has died to sin. And the word dead, it comes from the Greek word for a human corpse. And it's the picture of an actual dead person with no heartbeat. By using the particular word, Paul is depicting us to be absolutely lifeless to sin. Completely unresponsive to it. It's like when a doctor comes and he, he's tra- he, 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 if, if you don't have any feeling in your legs and he takes the pin and he sticks the bottom of your feet to see if you feel it. I'm dead to sin. I don't feel that sin anymore. Sin has lost its power over me. To continually count yourself dead to sin, you may have to speak to yourself to often take authority over your flesh. Is there anybody here besides me that speaks to themselves now and again? You know, we need to speak to ourselves. That's not fair, is it, Joe? We... You're supposed to raise your own hand, not somebody raise it for you, right? (laughs) I have to speak to myself now and again and say, Jay, knock it off. This path you're going down is going to lead to slavery. Knock it off. Speak to yourself. 
I used to, my, my fasting, I, uh, I, I, I challenge myself. I'll get a little hungry and say, oh, no, you don't. Oh, no, you don't. You're not going to put that on me. I talk to myself. There are certain things I can do. There are certain things I can do, and then there's things that only God can do. I can talk to myself. He's opened prison, the, the prison doors of sin, which I could not do, and now I have to walk through it. He's opened the prison doors, and now I have to walk out those doors. Verse 4, Paul calls it the newness of life. So how do we walk in newness of life? Let me give you two important words. First word is obedience. The second word is discipline. First, we practice obedience. Practice being obedient. Let me ask you something. Jeff, you're a coach. Why in the world do you practice? And I'm sure the guys behind you want to know the same thing. So you can yell at the kids. I appreciate that. (laughs) To make them better. better. Work on the things they're struggling with. with. Yeah. Yeah, Alex, you want to add anything to that? Very good. Schwartz, anything to add to all that? We practice so that we put the playbook in order, right? We practice so that when the time comes that we'll naturally do what we're supposed to do. Fair enough? It's 10 seconds left in the clock. And the old great Tim Schwartz, there were tie game. And Tim Schwartz calls a play. Do they say, oh, I've never heard that play before. Well, they might. I don't know. It depends on what, what, what play Tim calls. No, but he'll call a play that he believes will get us a basket. And it's a play that everyone knows. In fact, he might just write it out just so everybody remembers it. But it's been practiced before so that when they get in game time, all of a sudden, hey, it comes natural. You see, we don't practice that way, do we? Do we practice obedience? Do you practice obedience? Because if you don't practice obedience, then when the time comes, when push comes to shove, guess what? You're not going to know what to do. Practice obedience. You see, the problem is, is we get in the habit of practicing sin, not practicing obedience. We're being obedient to sinful nature rather than being obedient to God. Which one are you practicing? And I hope this really hits home because I hope it hits home on a daily, hourly, minute basis. Not just sitting here today saying, oh, yeah, I think I'll I'll practice that. No, no, no. I want you to practice it each day, each hour, each minute. Practice obedience. So that when the time comes, it'll come natural. It'll come natural. Next, we apply discipline. Again, as I said, while living here on this earth, sin will not stop trying to be our master. It must become our slave. And simply put, it takes self-discipline. I heard a saying that says, where attention goes, energy flows. Where attention goes, energy flows. Where your attention goes, whether it's to the sin nature or to the God nature, energy is going to flow. You know what? This is another thing. On self-discipline, command, (laughs) how do I put it here? Command sin to shut its mouth. 
command sin to shut its mouth. You're getting, you're getting pulled this way? Command sin to shut its mouth. Say, no, you be quiet. That's, we can do that because it says that sin has lost its power. Tell sin to shut its mouth. And remind ourselves that sin's lost its power at the cross and no longer has the right to rule and reign in our lives. Sin is not our master anymore. Remember that sign that Jesus hung over your head that says, out of business. You're not in the sin business any longer. Discipline is what will break the habits of our sin lives. So, talked a little bit about the Olympics last week. Um, how, many, how many recognize the name Ulud Kip, Kip Koje? Anybody recognize that name? Probably not. Are there any marathoners in here? Probably not. <laughs> not me. <laughs> Let me tell you about Ilud Kipchoge. Marathon runner from Kenya. He held the world's record marathon for the marathon record for a lot of years. This year at the Olympics is the first year that he had he did not finish. But they asked him all these years. He held the record, I think, till 2023, the marathon record. And let me give you the full thing. I didn't put the full thing up here, but listen to what he says. Athletes, athletics does not depend so much on the legs, but on the heart and mind. What has allowed me to last so long at the highest level is self-discipline. I set my priorities. I say no to what I know is not helpful. Did you get that? Do you say no to what you know is not helpful? Then he goes on to say, only the disciplined ones in life are free. If you are undisciplined, you are a slave to your moods and your passions. Think about that. Only the disciplined ones in your life are free. I'm telling you, when I talk about discipline, when I'm talking about disciplining your life, I want you to know that's a pathway of freedom, not slavery. How disciplined are you? I have to be honest. My wife's probably more disciplined than I am. I wish I was more disciplined in a lot of things, a lot of areas. How disciplined are you? Because discipline is the pathway to freedom we talk about in Christ. So the challenge out of this, out of Romans chapter 6, what Paul's talking about, I didn't get very far in Romans chapter 6, which I knew I wouldn't. But what he's trying to say here is, no, you, don't long, you no longer live. That's not where you live is in sin. You live in freedom. You don't live in the slavery, in the bondage that sin brings. You live in the freedom that Christ brings. Don't go back. Have a conversation with yourself. Every morning, I encourage you, every morning, boldly declare that you reckon you deem, you consider, you regard and count as a fact that you are dead to sin. We need to remind ourselves that every day. I am dead to this. I am dead to this. Don't think you can manage it. Don't think you can control it. Don't think you can hide it. Just be dead to it. Just be dead to it. Take authority over your flesh and tell it to shut its mouth and refuse to give it the right to rule in your life. 
It's interesting in verse 6. If we go back in verse 6, it says that the body of sin may be done away with. That doesn't mean that we're, always, we're never going to have to fight with sin again. But it means the power is done away with. It's done away with. Stop living there. As time goes on, I'm going to close with this. As time goes on, we're going to be challenged more and more and more. You know, we got a good challenge, a, a wake-up call, so to speak, last week from Jeff and Andrea. But the challenge for each one of us as Christ followers is to no longer live in the power of sin. To live in the freedom of Christ. Amen? You have anything, Jeff? Let's, let's stand as we pray. I think this morning the question, you know, I know we've all here dealt with sin. Let me ask you this. What have you gone back to? What have you gone back to that may be leading you into slavery? What have you what, what in your life has, is keeping you from being totally free? You know, it just seems sometimes it seems so easy just to allow that pull of sin just to keep pulling you, keep pulling you, keep pulling you, keep pulling you. Until you've gone farther than you ever thought you could. I just, I feel like this morning we need to just take some time in, 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 our, in our own time here And I just, I just sense that we just, there, that we need to take some time and just, just to repent before God. Just to repent before God. For going back. For going back. Maybe even, maybe even sin that, maybe even sin that, is new sin, so to speak. Just where you are, just in kind of your own presence, so to speak, in the presence of God. Can we do a little confessing? Can we kind of clean the slate with God a little bit? That sin that you thought was just nothing, that sin that you thought was just minor, no big deal, that sin that you thought you can manage and you realize that it's managing you. Let's just take a little time before God this morning with that, just confessing and, and asking forgiveness for that.
I encourage you this morning that which you, you confessed. Don't go back. Don't go back. I want you to know that we live We're justified through Christ. Yes, there's grace. But why go back and live in that way? Why go back? Live in the freedom. Live in the freedom that Christ died for you to live in. Every morning, get up, declare that you're out of business for sin. Talk to yourself, declare that you are a slave to God, not a slave to sin. Father, as we've stood here this morning and we've laid it out before you. Might be something that others know about, might be something that nobody knows about, but we know that you know about it. And we know that ultimately others will know because sin will expose. Father, for the times that we thought we could manage that, and we find ourselves being managed by that. Father, where we thought we can control it, I can just do a little bit, and I can control it. I can, and then pretty soon we're doing a little more, and pretty soon we're doing a little more, and we've drifted so far from your heart. Father, I, I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would be our counselor and our guide, as your word says. And that we would listen to that voice. That we would listen to that check in our spirit. That we would listen to those very, to that, that, that sense of, of conviction. And that we wouldn't be pulled to the sin, the slavery of sin but that we would be free to live as slaves to you. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Blessings to you.